We've been on a journey understanding that if you are a believer, there will be some awkwardness about you, um, that your life should be different, that there should be something distinctive and peculiar about you. And so we've been talking about being socially awkward, and we're ending the series today, and uh, it's going to be good. In fact, I'll give you a little behind-the-scenes uh, sermon prep info. Um, I actually had another message I was going to preach. had another message I was going to preach. Sometimes you're about to preach one message, and you're like, it needs to stay in the oven just a little bit more. So I'm going to preach that message later. Um, we had an incredible day yesterday with some of our key leaders. We had a master's class, and I shared a message there. And a lot of our leaders were like, oh, Pastor Robert, this is too good just for a master's class. You ought to preach it to the church on Sunday. So I was thinking about this morning. I said, you know what? I'm going to preach that. So uh, if it's not good, blame all the key leaders <laughs> of Social Dallas. No, but it's going to bless you. Hope you're ready to hear it. Stand with me to he hear the reading of God's Word. And we're going to look at two passages of Scripture today. I want to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 and 36. And then I want to go to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 26, and we'll read verses 36 through 46. When you're ready to read it, say yeah. yeah. If you need a little time to find it on your smart device or on your paper Bible, if you're that saved, or just to focus your attention on the screen, say hold on. I heard a few of those hold ons. I want to wait. Hebrews chapter 10, I love this verse of Scripture. The writer of Hebrews declares this, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. That's so nice. I want to read it twice. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere, hashtag don't quit, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. In Matthew chapter 26, we're going to look at this moment in the life of Jesus. And it says in verse 36, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. Now, this is powerful to me because we are getting intimate insight into the personal prayer life of Jesus. Understand that when the disciples say, teach us how to pray, and we call it the Lord's Prayer, he has really just given us the model for how to pray. In John 17, when he prays, he's basically praying for the church. He's praying for us that we would be one. But this is his personal, intimate, private prayer time. How many know if Jesus is paying, praying something, we need to pay attention to what he's praying? And he says this as he prays, my Father... If it is possible, make this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you man keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but that flesh <laughs> is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing, three times praying about this cup. And then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are y'all still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Can you say amen? amen. Ooh, I cannot wait to preach this. I want to, <clears throat> I want to, my bad. <clears throat> I'm good. Do you have some water? Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for bringing this cup. <laughs> Thank you for that. As if I planned that. 
this goblet over three times Jesus prays about a cup passing from him you didn't do anything to this did you you sure I'm just checking you know that's how they would kill kings in the Bible days in biblical antiquity if they wanted to kill a king they would put poison in your cup. That's the context of the cup. This was the need for a cup bearer. Mm, who wants that job? Your job is just to drink before the king and then they watch you. <laughs> and if you don't fall out and die, then they handed the cup to the king and they knew it was safe because what a detrimental thing it would be to drink a cup with poison. But what do we say then of a king who knows there's poison in the cup, but yet he chooses to drink it anyway? That king would have to be confident in the fact that death would not have the final say. And that he was coming back again, but he still had to drink the cup. I got a fancy title today. I want to preach to you from the subject, cup. <laughs> cup. You're laughing, but you need a cup. You need a cup. Because you need to have confidence under pressure. Confidence <laughs> under pressure. Lord, I ain't even started and I'm already preaching. Confidence under pressure. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. God, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, speak to us so clearly, so succinctly. God, we've not come here today to be entertained. God, we have come to be drastically changed. Transform us through the power of your word. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Everybody say it. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Confidence under pressure. It's the last sermon in the series. We may as well just get straight to it. How many of you would say, by a showing of hands, that you are good under pressure? Can I see your hand? You say you're good under pressure. Okay, okay, I see you. How many of you, the opposite, you say, uh-uh, I don't want the pressure. I need you to let me know what's happening three months in advance, and I need a massage before it happens. Don't disturb my peace. Come on, let me see y'all that say you don't do good under pressure. <laughs> Awesome. So, so we've separated the champions from the chumps already in the message. <laughs> I, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. But, but it is interesting, it is interesting to see how somebody can do something under pressure. To me, it is the litmus test of greatness. It's what really separates the average from the professionals. It's not the question, can you do the task? It's can you do it under pressure? Pressure. Sometimes it is the pressure that makes all the difference. Like some of you, you can sing real good in your shower. Yeah, I, I, I hear you just loud, got the reverb. Oh, say can. I mean, just real loud in the shower. But if we put you at the Super Bowl with the microphone, your knees would buckle. You would throw up before you got out there. Because it's one thing to sing it in the shower. It's a whole other thing to sing it. Ooh when you got millions of people watching you. Some of you, your putt game is so good at Top Golf. But if we took you to the Masters, that would be an entirely different level of pressure because I'm telling you, pressure makes the difference. It's not can you do the task, it's can you do it under pressure. Pressure, pressure. It's amazing what pressure will do to people. I was sharing with our leaders that one of my favorite movies, to me, it's a movie on leadership. Uh, it's a movie called The King's Speech. The King's Speech. And actor Colin Firth, he plays King George VI. And in the movie, we see his journey where he is pushed to be the king. He did not want to be the king. He fought against it. Come on, he ever fought against your destiny? Like, God, I don't want to do this. But he was pushed into being the king. And in the movie, you saw that when he was calm and in his quiet place, he was good. He was good having conversations with people. But anytime he had to make a speech and get in front of people, in fact, it's the opening movie of the scene. It's powerful. You see him sweating, heart pulsating. All of a sudden, his nose and lips start sweating. And he walks all the way up to the stage and they do this cool camera angle <laughs> while the people turn and they look at him and he gets up and they wait with tiptoe anticipation to hear what he's about to say and he goes today 
I get it. Yeah. And he starts breaking down in the middle of the speech. And then you see the faces of the people lose confidence. And then he loses his confidence. And the whole time I'm watching the movie, tears are going this way. And snot is going the other way. Because I'm like, ooh, that's pressure. I feel that pressure every single day because, ladies and gentlemen, this right here, what I'm doing, oh, is pressure personified. You don't believe it? Go on, come up here. <laughs> Go on, come up here and stand up here and see what your face looks like. This right here is pressure. I'm telling you, I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for me, but I do have evidence for it. You understand that the number one human fear is public speaking. Yeah. Death is number two. Yes, yes, that means people would rather be at a funeral in the casket than to speak at a funeral. This is no joke. And it's not like I'm just up here giving a TED talk, or giving a cute speech. When you preach the infallible, incorruptible, everlasting, eternal, unchanging word of God, you are not just up here saying what you want to say. You are subliminally and serendipitously suggesting to your audience that you are speaking on behalf of the preexistent, incarnate, powerful, omnipotent, omniscient God. No pressure. <laughs> and so before you leave the service today saying, oh, he just complained about preaching and the pressure of it. No, I'm not complaining. In fact, I'm willing to bet anything today. There's a lot of people listening to me who would say, hey, Pastor Robert, I'm not a preacher, I don't do public speaking, but please believe me when I tell you, I am under pressure. Who I'm willing to bet anything today that if the thoughts of everybody in this room and the people watching online right now could go public, you would be shocked at the pressure that the person sitting next to you is under. All kinds of pressure. Here's the thing about pressure, pressure is not prejudice. Pressure doesn't care your skin color. Pressure doesn't care who you voted for. Pressure will hit anybody at any place at any time. Pressure will show up in a classroom with a junior hire. It'll show up in a boardroom with somebody giving their first presentation for a job that they knew they shouldn't have got in the first place. Pressure will hit you in any moment. Pressure is in this room today. Pressure to perform. Pressure to meet the deadline. Pressure to start the business. Pressure to meet other people's expectations. Pressure to meet other people's unrealistic expectations. Pressure to be the perfect parent. Pressure to be the husband you're supposed to be. Pressure to be the wife you're supposed to be. Pressure to be the wife that was there before you. Oh, I'm going to hit everybody today. Pressure. It's crazy the amount of pressure that people rest under all kinds of financial pressure. And then got people asking you for money as if you don't have pressure on your life too. The other day I filled my tank. True story. I'm filling my tank. I'm sweating as I'm filling my tank. $105 to fill up my tank. I'm not lying. Then I get in my car and look at the temperature. It's 105. I said, this is hell right here. How in the world? How in the world? My gas. Gas tank price and the temperature is the exact same pressure. Pressure, 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 all kinds of pressure. Pressure to get married. It's funny because people will say stuff to you in conversation, sometimes casually, and sometimes what they say will bring pressure. Oh, you still ain't found nobody? You know you ain't getting younger. Pressure, pr pressure to have kids. I sure would like to have some grandkids this century. Pressure. <laughs> pressure to go back to school because everybody in your family has more degrees than a thermometer. And there you are struggling at the dinner table as they're talking about what papers and what dissertations they're working on. And you sitting up here going, yeah, did y'all catch that Netflix uh, show? <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> you start to feel pressure. You would be shocked at the pressure that is in this room. And I found it is the trick of the enemy to get you to buckle under the pressure, to get you to cope and medicate the pressure. But I'm telling you, God gives us this insight into the life of Jesus and the final moments as the cross is pending to show him and show us that you can have confidence under the pressure, that you can feel the pressure and still stand up and say, not my will, but your will be done. I have been called for such a time as this. And although I have the pressure, Pressure. The pressure does not mean I'm not called to it. Ooh, see, here's, here's what I love about God. I am fully convinced that the enemy 
cannot stop the call of God that is on your life. Oh, he cannot do it. If you're nervous about the enemy messing up your call, chillax today and rest in the fact that the enemy cannot mess up your call. He can't touch the call of God that is on your life. As a matter of fact, the enemy can't even do anything with the gifts God has given you to accomplish that call because your God is so good, he made sure that you already had every gift that you needed to accomplish the unique call that was on your life. Quit being jealous of other people. Quit comparing yourself to other people. You've got the gift that you need for the call that you have. The enemy he cannot touch your call. He cannot touch your gift. Oh, but he can touch your confidence. And if he can get your confidence, you will shrink back from your call. And often the way he gets your confidence is through pressure. He attacks your confidence through pressure, getting you to be intimidated, getting you to back down from something you should be stepping into. I cannot tell you how many people I have seen in life that God has a call on their life, they're anointed to do it, they're gifted to do it, but instead of stepping up, they step back in intimidation because of the pressure. Pressure. I want to know, how are you doing with the pressure? How is the pressure on your life? Do you have confidence in the pressure or are you buckling under the pressure. If I'm being honest, I think pressure mounts up for Christians more than any other group of people. Oh yes, because let's not get it twisted. We are under attack. And not just from the devil. Ooh, if you don't realize it, you're actually being hit from three areas right now. Pew, pew, pew. Three areas. Constantly. Pew, pew, pew. This is the life of a believer. Pew, pew, pew. I'm giving you sound effects. This is the last time we're going to be in here. We got three weeks at home. I'm giving it all I got today. You are getting hit as a believer. Every single moment from three different areas, pew, 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 every single day, you are being hit, watch this, by the world, by Satan, and by your flesh. Those are the three enemies that are always attacking you, pew, 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 the world, the enemy, and your flesh. You are being attacked by the world because how many of you know we live in a world that is completely antithetical and opposed to the kingdom of God? Be careful when you fit in with the systems, with the ideology of this world. Be careful if you agree with every hashtag of this world. This kingdom is so opposite of this world. It makes no sense. It's, it's always opposite day in the kingdom of God. Always opposite. This world, you want to be the best? Fight your way to the top and kick everybody on the way there. In the kingdom, no, you serve and you swash nasty feet and you come down to the bottom. In this world, you flex, you put out your business card and you show your pride. In the kingdom, you have humility because promotion comes from God. He who humbles himself will be exalted. It's completely opposite. It's completely opposite. Oh, y'all so shout. I'm going to keep going. In this kingdom, it's amazing. You get all you can, can all you get and be stingy. In the kingdom of God, it is radical generosity and you give and give and give this kingdom oh this kingdom you can make statements like I can do what I want it's mine not in the kingdom of God you were bought with the price you are not your own you got to be real careful because this kingdom of the world is completely opposite of the kingdom of God so I'm constantly fighting with the world the world I feel like teaching just a little bit today the world, the world, there's different words for world in the New Testament, especially in Paul's letters. The world is different because you can get confused because it's like, hold on, God so loved the world. And then he says, don't be transformed, don't be conformed to the world, but that's different. Uh, Paul talks about the world being the cosmos. Paul talks about the world being mankind. But then there's also a word for world that means the system of the culture that is completely opposite to the ways of God. So I got that hitting me. And then I got the devil hitting me who is real, and demonic attack is real. Pew. So he's attacking me too. And he always attacks me, hear me, with lies. The Bible says in John chapter 8, all he can speak is lies. And the scariest thing about the enemy is he will give you a lie that has just a little dash of truth, but it's still a lie. And nothing scarier than a lie that you have embraced as true. So the enemy's hitting me. And if that wasn't enough, then I got my flesh. What's in me? I don't care how saved you are. I don't care if you floated in here and read Leviticus this morning. <laughs> you still are working on your flesh. You still have some thoughts that hit you that you go, ooh, that was not the Lord. That needs to be renewed. 
used just when you think you got it all together. Isn't it true? You're like, oh, I'm a child of God. I function in peace. I love my neighbor. And then they cut you off on the highway. And all of a sudden, stuff just comes out of you that you didn't know was still in you. So don't trip. Don't act. <laughs> like you don't still got flesh. So now I'm being hit by all three of those are coming against me. And I'm still trying to step into the call of God that's on my life. That is awkward. That is pressure. And if I can add to it, pressure is harder for believers as well. Because there is no environment like the church environment where you feel the pressure to act like you're always good. Like you're always okay. No, I'm telling you, some Christians have lost their mind going through the most difficult season. How are you? I'm blessed. No, but how are you? I'm good. God is good all the time. I know he's good. How are you? Isn't that crazy? I'm telling you, we will put stuff in Christianese and wrap it up all nice while we having breakdowns. That's why we need good theology and a good therapist. Hallelujah. Because that's crazy sometimes in the church. The pressure to be like you. Okay, in fact, I'm going to interrupt this regularly scheduled sermon so you get involved in a, a little verbal exercise real quick. Would you do me a favor and just look at your neighbor? I know it's awkward, but come on, we ended the series. Look at your neighbor, whichever one you choose. Look at them. Say neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. God, is God is good. All the time. All the time. All the time. God, is good. God is good. Look at that same neighbor and say neighbor. neighbor. Newsflash. Newsflash. I'm not God. Oh, that right there will make me do the Holy Ghost two-step. He is good all the time. I am not good all the time. Sometimes I'm annoyed. Sometimes I'm frustrated. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes you get on my nerve. Sometimes I don't want to talk to my neighbor. Sometimes, sometimes I'm stressed. Sometimes I'm going through it. Sometimes I got an attitude problem. Sometimes I'm tempted. Quit acting like you good all the time. Ooh, don't push me, cause I'm close to the end. I'm dragging that thing. Challenge is the pressure. The pressure. The pressure. I find it intriguing that even cars, even your tires, do better at gauging pressure than you do. <laughs> You realize they have it. They, they, they mandated it. They mandated in 2007 that tires have to have this thing called TPMS, Tire Pressure Monitoring System. And they implemented it because so many people were crashing. So many people were having blowouts in their tires. And what's intriguing to me is you can have a blowout not because there's too much air or not just because there's too much air in your tire. You can have a blowout because there's not enough air in your tire. So the tension that your tires have to live in is the right amount of pressure. The tension of a healthy life is the right amount of pressure. The goal is not to get rid of the pressure. It's to have the right amount of pressure. Some of you, this is gonna mess you up. Your life is falling apart because you don't have enough pressure. You don't have enough. And, and you praying about stuff that's just adulting. <laughs> like you praying about stuff that's just life. <laughs> And I, I feel bad for you because your faith will never graduate to a mature level because there are some real attacks. But some of the things you're praying about is not an attack. It's because you don't have enough pressure in your life. And there's some of us who have so much pressure, who have carried on so much weight that we are overinflated and you're about to pop. And the challenge of life is to live in the right amount of pressure because pressure is undeniable. The question is how you're going to handle it. Oh, look at the Apostle Paul. I love what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I love this verse because we get intimate insight into Paul. Generally, he's writing letters to churches, fixing these crazy churches. But I love this because Paul gives us some insight. Look at what he posts on the gram. He's like, I'm going to let y'all know what I feel. I got time today. Look at what he says. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great Pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, 
We felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Do you see the power of what Paul said in those verses? When you read the first half, you're like, Paul, are you okay? It seems like you're really going through it. He's complaining about the pressure. He said it felt like the sentence of death, but then he looks back after us in those next two verses and said, but the pressure was necessary because I didn't need to rely on myself. He said, my call was so great. God wanted to make sure that I wasn't relying on my own ingenuity, on my own talent, on my own gift. Sometimes the pressure is to push you into reliance on God. So somebody right now needs to start thanking God for your pressure. You know why? That pressure is maturing you. That pressure is making you pray. That pressure is making you trust. That pressure is making you worship. As a matter of fact, you haven't really worshiped until you've worshiped under pressure. Anybody can worship when your spouse is good, your kids are making straight A's, you got money in the bank, you got the raise and a brand new Tesla. That is not the test of your worship. I want to know, can you worship when you got the divorce papers and when there's sickness in your body, when your kids are going crazy, can you still say, this is a house of miracles when you got hell in your house? That's how I know you really can worship because I did it under pressure. Oh, anybody can shout when God sends you flowers. I want to know, can you shout when you're facing a fiery furnace like the three Hebrew boys and say, my God can deliver me, my God will deliver me, but even if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow down because I know that the pressure is creating something greater on the inside of me. My worship goes up under the pressure. Oh, I wish somebody would take like 15 seconds and praise God like you know that you worship better under the pressure. Oh, you ain't been through nothing. I mean, praise him like you know the pressure is creating a greater glory on the inside of you. I'm better under pressure. I was made for this under pressure. Devin, if you wanted to kill me, you shouldn't have sent the pressure. Woo. All right. Y'all calm down. I said I was going to teach today and be very calm. Pressure. The pressure is doing something in your life. The pressure is creating something in you that you would not have if not for the pressure. They don't massage coals to get diamonds. Somebody just got it. It's the pressure that creates it. You need the pressure. Here we have the life of Jesus who's in a garden. He already knew he was going to the cross. He knew that before the foundation of the earth. He knew it when he showed up in Bethlehem. But as it's getting closer, he's under pressure. So much so that we'll later find out he is sweating blood. That's pressure. And I look at this intimate life of Jesus that would make him pray three times and sweat blood. There's at least four things I see in this text that will help us to have confidence under pressure. I want to give you four things. I'm not going to be before you long. Just these four things. And I have points today, which is a big deal, so you should take notes. Four things that you have to have if you're going to have confidence under pressure. Number one, you want to have confidence under pressure, you need a preview. A preview. You need a preview of what? A preview of the promise of God that is over your life. In between the preview and the premiere date, there will always be pressure. And if you don't hold on to the preview while you're facing the pressure, you will walk away and miss the premiere date. I'm gonna bring it all the way home. How many of you, uh, you like movies, like going to the movies? Where my movie people at? Come on, I can rock with y'all. Actually, take that back. I can rock with half of y'all because there's two types of moviegoers. There's some of y'all that if the movie starts at seven, you leaving the house at 6.55. Talking about, it's previews. I don't rock with y'all. I don't go to the movies with y'all. My type of people, when the movie started at 7, we leave the house at 5.50, okay? 
because this is an experience, okay? I, I have things that I have to do, okay? I need to get there in time. I have to get my seat. I have to get my icy. I got to strategically mix the red and the blue together in the slushy. I got to get my popcorn, look at the attendant and say, hold up, don't fill it up to the top. I got to have time to put the butter, shake it and do it again. I like getting there in time. I don't want to rush. I want to step over every, no, 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 no. I want to sit in my seat and I want to see the previews. I need the previews. I I have to have the previews because the only thing better than going to see a movie is going to see what movie you're going to see next while you're seeing the movie. I like previews. Okay? It's an experience for me. And it blows my mind how you can be watching a preview. It is incredible their ability to take snippets of a three hour movie, have you on the edge of your seat all the way up to the point you're like, oh, I can't wait for this to come out. And right at the end, they'll hit you with fall 2050. Yo, 2050? I gotta wait till 2050 to see this movie? Sometimes they won't even give you that courtesy. You'll be right on the edge of your seat and they'll go, coming soon. <laughs> when it soon? That is exactly how God works. I'm telling you, he will give you a preview. He'll give you a preview. He'll show you your purpose, your destiny. Come on, you ever been there? It's a power of being in God's presence. He'll show you what he's gonna do. You'll be like, ooh. I'm about to have the business. I'm about to be blessed. I know what it's about to be. You get the preview, and right after that, you'll lose your job. You be like, I thought you said. I told you, coming soon. <laughs> when is soon? I'll tell you when. <laughs> and the pressure is having to wait in between the preview and the premiere date. This is how God works. He did it for everybody. A Abraham, Abraham, Sarah, same thing happened. God says, look at the stars, look at the sand. I'm gonna make you the father of many nations. Preview, coming soon to a womb near you. Sarah, you're gonna give birth. They had to wait and wait. Now they senior citizens going to CVS, <laughs> buying dentures and diapers, waiting on the premiere day. Joseph had a dream. God gave it to him as a teenager. They're going to bow to you. But in between the preview and the premiere day, the pit, a prison sentence, and it was so much pressure. I'm not worried about your shout in the preview. I want to know, can you hold on to that preview when the pressure is mounting and it hasn't premiered in your life yet? Every single person that has confidence under pressure has held on to the preview the promise, the word of God. Before we planted this church, I just asked God for one thing. Give me a word that we're supposed to plant. And until I got that word, we didn't officially plant. Some of y'all were here in the early stages. I said, this is a wonderful gathering. <laughs> I didn't say it was a church until I got a word because I know the pressure that comes. And even when hell is whispering into my ear, and tired nights and people with opinions and all that. Can we add that to the pressure? Pressure to post. Well, if you're really a man of God, you would post on this and you would post on that. Pressure in this divisive age in which we live where nobody wants to have discourse, but everybody wants to demonize somebody that's different than them. The pressure. I knew what we were about to face and I had to get a word from God because when you are coming against the tag and there's all kinds of pressure, you've got to hold on to the word of God and the preview he gave you. you need a preview. But you don't just need a preview. Number two, I'm almost done. You need a place. You need a place. You need a place of consistent communion and prayer with God. It's not enough to have a preview if you don't have the place. As a matter of fact, it's in the place that you'll often get the preview. I want to show you something that I, I read too fast and I missed. Because when you read the Gethsemane account of Matthew and Mark, you will think that Jesus just stumbled on the Garden of Gethsemane one day and started praying there. But I love Luke's account, because Luke is a doctor and doctors are thorough. And look at what Luke shows us about this moment. He says that Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him on reaching the, hello, reaching the place. He said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Do you know what the most powerful part of this scripture is? That as usual, 
This was not Jesus' first time in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had been there before. This was not Jesus going, whoo, cross is getting close. I better find me a place to pray. You know how some of us do. It's like we ain't talked to God all year, but then let something break off, let us lose our job, or let us get a bad report. Ooh, Father. Then we find a prayer closet, get a big bottle of Costco oil, and say, now I better pray. No, 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 this is not that. He had been there before. He had a consistent place, and I want to practically encourage somebody in here today. If you want to start having confidence under the pressure, then you need a consistent place of prayer and communion with God. Come on, there's too much attack. There's too much hell coming against you for you not to have a place. Place. If there's anything the enemy is going to fight, he's going to fight your place. He will fight your place with everything within him. Have you ever noticed, am I the only one? You binge watching a Netflix show, you can stay up all night. Oh, I'm going to watch the whole series. And you start reading your Bible. I'm talking about like some exciting Ephesians. I ain't talking about like Leviticus. Just and all of a sudden you start dozing. Why is that? Because the enemy's fighting the place. He knows the power of what happens when that word gets in you and you commune with God. I'm telling you, fight for your place. Fight for your place. I think it was A.W. Tozer who had etched in his Bible or is known for saying that this Bible will keep me from sin. Anything that keeps me from this Bible is sin. It's a statement from a man who's saying, I know the power of a place. Jesus didn't stumble into the Garden of Gethsemane. He had been there before, always communing with the Father. I want to challenge you to mature from being a 911 believer. Lord, it's an emergency. I need you. To a Psalm 91 one believer. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Because there's power in dwelling. Is this helping anybody? You don't just need a preview. You don't just need a place, Whew. but you also need the right people with you. If you got a preview and you got a place, but you don't got the right people with you, whoo, you're going to buckle under the pressure. Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Did you read the shade that was just thrown in those verses right there? <laughs> it's that Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He then takes Peter, James, and John. Okay, last service, I got to be extra. <laughs> Twelve of them right here. He said, come on, y'all, let's go pray. They start going. I don't know if they walked in a single file line. I always wondered, how do they walk? Like Jesus in the middle, <laughs> six this side, six this side, single file line. I don't know how they walked. <laughs> but here they go, <laughs> walking. He said, you want to go pray? Let's go pray. <laughs> they walking. All of a sudden, he says, oh, hold up. Peter, James, John, y'all come on. The rest of y'all stay here. And then they keep walking. Come on, y'all. Can you imagine being the other nine? <laughs> oh, really? Okay, cool. No, go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. That's fine left them right there and took the other three. Why? I'm under pressure. When you are under pressure, you are vulnerable. When you are under pressure, sometimes when the pressure is greater, your circle will have to get smaller. It's not being rude. I got to steward this intimate space because when I am under pressure, I am vulnerable. I am not me when I'm under pressure. I got to make sure I got the right people around me when I'm under pressure. When I'm under pressure, I am susceptible to your words. So I don't need you if you always finding something wrong with the situation. If you're constantly giving me negative news, I can't have you around me when I'm under pressure. When I'm under pressure, I need encouragers. When I'm under pressure, I need somebody to say, no, you were called to this. You can do this. You are called for such a time as this. You are a mighty man of God. I don't need people talking about who I was when I'm under pressure. I need people calling me into who I'm supposed to be when I'm under pressure. I need the right people. Push me into my purpose. Don't tell me what you see. Tell me what I could be. Jesus is modeling something for us that sometimes when the pressure gets greater, your circle does have to get smaller. Everybody can't handle the vulnerability of you being under pressure. Look at Jesus. 
The same savior who was asleep in a hurricane. <laughs> they panicking. Ah, Lord, don't you care? They're waking him up. What? It's a hurricane. Oh, all right, peace. Be still. <laughs> this same savior is now running to them. Tell them about wake up. Please, can't you just pray with me one hour? He's vulnerable. He's under pressure. It's the difference between a hurricane hitting your boat and a hurricane hitting your heart. Because the first time in his life, the father is going to turn his back on him. He has never been disconnected from his father. And even before the cross, he can feel the separation coming because of my sin and your sin. He's under pressure. And when you're under pressure, you got to have the right people. I don't know who this is for, but some of you are connected to people who are taking advantage of your vulnerability yeah. while you're under pressure. Yeah. And God's word for you today is to do an audit of the people in your life. Because maybe they're usurping the confidence that you would have under the pressure. So he takes Peter, James, and John. And right when I got excited about the preview, and right when I got excited about the place and the people, these fools show me that even if you have the right people, your confidence still can't be in those people. Because he has the right people, and he just asked them to pray. Come on, this is a dude that's done miracles, who's let you roll with him the greatest internship for three years. <laughs> He's asking for a little prayer time. And although he has the right three, look at what they do. <laughs> three times sleeping. Proof positive of the fragility of humanity. And that although you have the right people, your hope cannot be in people. Your hope. Some of you, you're so heartbroken, and I'm not justifying what that person did to you, but I am saying you might have had too high of a hope and a trust in that person. And some of us, that's the problem. We don't realize that the flesh is weak and the spirit is willing. Stop judging people that fell asleep on you when you sleep too. You sleep too? I don't know, maybe because I'm getting older. I got so much grace for people now. It's like, it's cool. Go on sleep. You see how he finally got there? He's like, go on sleep. Don't worry about it. Some of us, I'm telling you, that's why we have a whole generation that's like, my church hurt. And I'm not belittling it. Hear me, leadership has to have accountability. We should treat people right. But part of the problem is some of you, you put too much hope in man and people. And so because you put your hope way up here in that person, you gave them a huge chasm to fall from. Meanwhile, your hope in your mechanic was like right here. So when he lets you down, it's not that big of a fall. But maybe we just need to get to the place of saying, hey, Lord, help me to be a trustworthy, right person that can steward vulnerability, but also help me have grace for people that fall asleep, because I fall asleep too. You need a preview, you need a place, you need the right people. But ultimately, my hope cannot be in people, because people cannot be my source of, number four, and I'm done, power. You need power. Can y'all play and make this sound real spiritual? People cannot be my source of power. I've got to have, hear me, supernatural power to have the confidence under the pressure, especially in the climate that we live today. And some of you are trying to drink the cup in your own strength, in your own power. You will not do it. You first need to get the preview, get to the place, get the right people. But these words need to come out of your heart. Perhaps some of the most powerful words. Not my will, but your will be done. That was the prayer he prayed before he took the cup. You need power to pray that prayer. Because his will will more often than not be diametrically opposed to your will. 
And you cannot do that in your own strength. My will is to speak to my enemies in a tongue that needs no interpretation. His will is to bless them, to pray for those that curse me. My will huh, is to remember every way you hurt me and the date you did it. I'm Enneagram 5. I remember everything. I never said that. Actually, you did. It was November 23rd at 6 p.m. I actually still have the text message. I don't know if you wanted to. My will is that. His will is forgive them and let it go. You cannot do that in your own strength. You need power. And watch this. Thank God for Dr. Luke. Because he shows us that after Jesus prayed that prayer, he got power. This is going to blow your mind. I never saw this before. But I want you to look at this in Luke. Only Luke gives us this. He says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And right after that prayer, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Ooh, I'll take those three claps. Do you see the power in that text right there? After he prayed that prayer, the Bible says an angel came and strengthened Jesus. When I read that, I'm telling you, I had some issues with Mel Gibson. Because I saw the passion of the Christ. I saw the passion of the Christ. I saw a couple of times. And when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mel did not put that angel in that scene. I didn't see the angel. I saw the little demonic character with no eyebrows that was in there with the little snake. I didn't see the angel. But I sure wish he would have put the angel in the movie because that is a powerful part of the story to know that once I've gotten a promise from God, once I've gotten a preview, to know that once I have a consistent and constant place of communion with the Father, to know that once I have the right people, but know that even those right people are still going to let me down. Just because you let me down doesn't mean I'm without hope. It doesn't mean I'm without strength. I want to thank God for this angel that came and gave Jesus power in the moment he was under pressure. Who am I preaching to today? You don't have a clue. The angels, the strength that God will give you, the power that God will give you, even when your back is up against the wall and you're under pressure, he will will give you the power that you need. Can anybody testify to the power of God in a moment when you thought you were going to lose your mind, in a moment where you said, I can't take another thing, and then another thing happened, but somehow, some way, you were still standing, you were still there. That's the power of God giving you the strength. I came to tell you, you're stronger than you think you are. You need to step in the confidence even when you got the pressure. It's so crazy. For years, I always focused on the sweat of blood. I never saw that the angel came and brought the strength. And I think there's so many of us, you're so busy looking at the blood, at the stress, that you miss the strength. You don't even realize the strength that came to you even when you felt like breaking down, but you did it. You don't even realize the strength that came to you. That's why you should never let anybody judge your worship. We're not just singing songs. Strength comes into my life as I lift up my hands. Strength comes into my life as I sing these songs. Strength comes into my life as I open up my mouth and give God praise in the midst of my pain. Come on, I need somebody even right now to get up on your feet. God wants to give you strength today, but you better open up your mouth and lift up your hands to heaven and say, God, I need the strength. I've been looking at the sweat, but God, give me strength. Give me power to raise these kids. Give me power as I'm back in school. Give me power on this job. Give me the confidence I need under the pressure. Thank you that when the pressure is mounting, we don't have to buckle down. God, thank you that the pressure is producing something that the comfort never could. You're giving us a greater weight of glory. 
Father, would you help us today to switch our perspective from looking at the sweat of blood to looking at the strength that we've received. Thank you. In the climate where so many people are losing their mind, they are going to substances to cope with the pressure. Father, we come to you knowing that you can give us confidence under the pressure. Lord, we're not going to pass off the cup. You've given us the model. You went before us. God, we will say, not my will, but your will be done. We will drink of that cup. Thank you that our lives are testimonies to other people who are under the same amount of pressure and they're watching how we handle it. Thank you that you use our lives to preach the gospel to other people. So that as we stand with confidence under the pressure, we can stand boldly declaring it was not our strength, it was not our might or our power, but it was by your spirit, Jesus. Do it today.